Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I hope you're all quite well and safe. Dear distinguished speakers, dear colleagues, dear audience, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this very timely webinar on the future of EU-US relations, organized by the Renew Europe Group in the European Parliament. I think we all sighed with relief when it was finally confirmed that Joe Biden would be the next president of the United States with Kamala Harris by his side as vice president. Relief, because in three months, we will again have a close and reliable partner across the Atlantic, a partner which talks to us first and then maybe do a Twitter and not in the other way around. Our partnership with the States goes back a long time. Much of our history is shared and there is much more that connects it than what divides us. With Joe Biden, we have a president who acknowledges and who will work constructively to maintain our strong bond. Our Renew Europe group has been working on a position paper on the future relations between the EU and the US. In this paper, dear colleagues, we highlight our hope for a close cooperation and active partnership in our advocacy for a world order based on strong multilateralism. We also express the desire to develop a common approach towards major powers such as China, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. And we seek to work together on the stabilization of the regions, which have been plagued by conflict in recent months and years. We also call for a strong transatlantic cooperation within the framework of NATO. As much as we all relieved and want to look ahead of the four years of Trump, a Biden presidency cannot mean that Europe will now rest on its laurels. It takes two to tango, I always say. It is my conviction that in the new multipolar world order, the EU and the US need to stand next to each other as strong allies in defense of a liberal democracy, multilateralism, and a rules-based international order. We, Europe, must therefore show the new US administration that we mean business, that we no longer want to hide behind the back of the US, but that we want to stand next to the US. This will be in the both interest of both countries and more importantly, of the world as a whole. So let us now turn the page and do everything in our power to combat today's global challenges through dialogue, cooperation and mutual respect. I strongly believe that this is the way forward. Before we move on to the introductory remarks by our good president, Mr. Dacian Cholas and Libe coordinator, Sophie Entfeld, I will briefly run you through the practical details of the event. This meeting is web streamed on Zoom, the Renew Europe Facebook page and on Livecast. Interpretation is provided in English, French and Spanish but also on the Zoom platform where you have the option to choose between one of the three languages. The stream of live cost will be in English. You can send us questions throughout the event in the chat boxes of any of these three platforms. And we will try to address them during the Q&A session. Please identify yourself and mention whom you would like to address the question to. And may I ask you to keep your mics muted when you're not on speaking mode. That being said, I look forward to this webinar and to a fruitful discussion. And now I would really like to give the floor to a very good present, Dacian Cholas. Dacian, the floor is all yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Hilde. And thank you, for, uh, thank you to all of you uh, for attending this meeting. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Hilde, uh, Sophia, Hilde, uh, Sophie Inveld, and uh, uh, Liche Scharmaika, our colleagues. Uh, coordinators from uh, AFET, from uh, LIBE and uh, INTA. They are uh, all three of them coordinating the elaboration of our uh, EU-US uh, relations policy paper that we are preparing now since some uh, weeks. And uh, thank you very much uh, to our friends, uh, Anthony uh, Gardner, Cecilia Manstrom being uh, with us, but also thanks uh, Ambassador uh, Lambrinidis being uh, with us and uh, Dr. Carpenter. It's a real uh, privilege to exchange with you uh, and to help us uh, to uh, 
uh, have a good uh, fundamentation of our ideas in this uh, policy uh, paper. But beyond the interest of Renew Europe group to work on this uh, paper, uh, I think this is uh, really very timely, this uh, discussion with uh, the preparation of uh, installation of a new Biden administration. Because uh, unfortunately, over the last uh, few years, these uh, relations between the uh, US and the uh, European uh, Union suffered some uh, setbacks on foreign affairs, but also on trade, on the data protection, climate change, uh, our uh, different positions on the, some key international organizations. And uh, unfortunately also the time uh, don't wait for us because now we have to rebuild our uh, relation taking into account this new context. We cannot uh, uh, re, uh, go, uh, go back in the, in the time and to, to try to rebuild what uh, unfortunately we lost these last years but we have to take into account the new reality of the, uh, of the world. And we have in front of us some uh, significant challenges because after uh, COVID-19, uh, not only the economy, but also the uh, democratic principles and values are challenged. Uh, this is internally in uh, European Union and I think also in uh, US, but uh, I would be very interested to see your opinion on that but also uh, externally. And also when we look on the terrorism, uh, cyber attacks, uh, nuclear uh, proliferation. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of files on, uh, on our uh, agenda. Therefore, we should reinvent our cooperation, making sure that uh, it, this is uh, for the tomorrow's world. Uh, because uh, I think what's happened in the, in the world no matter what's happened in the world, uh, the world need a strong US European Union uh, cooperation. Uh, for that, so we need to uh, go back also to the fundamentals. And I would like uh, that you refer uh, today to, uh, to that. Because the values of democracy, freedom, uh, human rights, we need that at home in European Union and I think in uh, US and also uh, beyond. And uh, for that, the Global Summit Democracy proposed by uh, the president uh, elected uh, Biden, I think it's a very good uh, step into this uh, direction. And you can be sure that our group, Renew Europe uh, group, but also the parliament, and we will uh, be sure that the parliament, European parliament, will be a strong partner for this uh, very good uh, initiative because uh, this uh, rule of law, uh, values of democracy, freedom are challenged now during uh, this uh, COVID. And I think we need together to transmit a very strong signal on the importance of this foundation of rebuilding our economy and uh, rebuilding our uh, relations after this uh, COVID. But also on climate change, we are very happy to see the good, very positive signals transmitted by uh, uh, the new Biden uh, administration. It's another pillar uh, to rebuild our relations and we should start uh, very quickly to uh, work together in order to prepare the COP26 uh, to Glasgow, which is a very good uh, opportunity uh, to realign ourselves on that. And the COVID the pandemic fights, on uh, economic and uh, trade relaunch, uh, digital uh, agenda, transatlantic uh, defense. Uh, all these uh, are uh, the priorities on our agenda. I am sure that on, on trade relaunch, but not only uh, uh, my friend and former colleague Cecilia Manson will refer to that. She has a very strong experience on that, but also uh, Tony Garners, our former uh, ambassador in uh, European Union, so I think we have a very good basis for a, a very fruitful discussion uh, today. So thank you again uh, being uh, uh, with us and I uh, hope to, to start our work uh, together as soon as possible. Thank you, Hilda. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, for your valuable insights. And there was a little change in the program. So now I would like to give the floor to Anthony Gardner, Senior Advisor of Brunswick and the former United States Ambassador to the, to the European Union. You were ambassador from 2014 to 2017. 
And Mr. Ambassador, we have, of course, some questions. What can we expect from the future Biden administration? Where will we see the biggest changes in comparison to the current administration and where the most continuity? So the floor is yours, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you very much. It feels like a family reunion with so many friends. <laughs> Dachan and, and, and Stavros and Cecilia and my uh, friend and former colleague, uh, Mike Carpenter. Thank you for giving me the floor and I'm really sorry that something's been dropped on me so I, I have to leave earlier than I thought. So it's very kind of you. Uh, I'll be brief. I, I speak as a private citizen, uh, obviously, but uh, you know, worked early in the campaign along with my good friend, Mike Carpenter. So here are a few reflections on the questions you asked. Um, the first is that we need to seize the day you know, the weight of history is on our shoulders. Uh, we have four years, obviously, but probably less. And uh, there will be so much to do domestically to clean up the mess. Um, so in foreign policy, um, we will really have to focus on what is doable and what is practicable and has high impact and is relatively uncontroversial. And I can tell you that uh, I think of the campaign is focused on these things. We need to show that working with allies, working within the rules, working with multilateral institutions yields better results than the Trump way of working unilaterally and bilaterally and transactionally and often insulting allies. Uh, and this is important, not just for us, but also for you, because if we fail, we will face an even more virulent form of demagogic populism perhaps in four years. The other thing by way of preamble I want to say is that no one I think wants uh, or expects an Obama 3.0. Too much has happened. Uh, Trump isn't gonna go away. Trumpism hasn't been defeated. But here are a few things I think we really can do. And I know I only have five minutes so I'll try to be pretty brief here. Um, first, I, I think that um, well, let me also say that I was very happy to see that the EU is working on its own paper, as, as described by the Financial Times. And a lot of the ideas in that article mesh very well with what I think many uh, of us on the US side have been thinking. So strong support for Paris Climate Accords, clearly, but we need to actually make those targets tougher. And you've seen what the president-elect has said. Um, there clearly will be support for European integration for the EU in particular. Many of you may remember what Biden said in Strasbourg in 2011, which is a very strong statement of support. And you will see that early on. What's very different is that this president, uh, uh, the president-elect, unlike the current president, believes that all three sides of the US, UK, UK, EU, EU, US triangle are important. They must work together. The current president thinks the only side of the triangle that matters is US and UK. But in reality, in fact, the UK has gotten very, very little from this romance. Um, you will see a support for multilateralism, including the WTO, including the WHO, but also a call for reform of both. You will see, I think, a support of free trade rather than managed trade you will see a support, clear support for the rule of law, human rights, good governance, uh, and uh, anti-corruption efforts, all things that this president has barely talked about. On free trade, we're not going back to TTIP, uh, and Cecilia, I'm pretty sure will agree with me. We were, you know, I really enjoyed cooperating with her on TTIP, and we got a lot done, by the way, but we're not going back to those days. Having said that, a lot can be done. I think we can eliminate tariffs on industrial goods trade, along with some movement by uh, the EU on agriculture. Uh, I think we can indeed uh, strike agreements on regular regulatory cooperation, for example, in non-safety auto sector. I think we can extend the scope of the pharmaceutical mutual recognition agreement. I think, and I hope I would expect, that the US will lift its sanctions on aluminum and steel tariffs in return for the EU lifting its counter sanctions. I hope and expect that we will settle the Airbus Boeing dispute. I hope and expect that we will lift the veto on the dispute settlement body and make the WTO work again. We need to cooperate on the appointment of the next director general. 
Um, and I hope and expect that we will relaunch some of the plurilateral trade negotiations like the environmental goods agreement. And more important than anything, we need to focus on the structural problems that are uh, creating issues in our trade relationship with China. And I say structural because this present is focused just on uh, you know, the superficial elements of China buying more products from the United States. I would like us to set up immediately a task force on WTO reform. And I know the commission has done a lot of good work on this. I would like us to work on COVID, which is incredible that this president hasn't done that, and future pandemics. Just a little footnote, Stavros remembers this. In 1995, this was in the new transatlantic agenda and unfortunately we didn't do anything about it. We can work with you on supply chain resilience, reducing dependence on China, not decoupling, but reducing dependence on China for key supplies. You will see a support for NATO, a search now more difficult, Mike can talk about this in detail, to save the Iran nuclear accord. Um, there's unfinished business with Russia here, clearly. Mike can I'm sure talk about that. We need, we need to work with Europe on countering propaganda and election interference. And um, you know, so that's already a huge agenda. Let me just end by saying not everything will be uh, smooth sailing. And I just want to mention two areas where we need to be careful. Privacy shield is an issue. And I, I, um, I know Sophie's on the line, uh, has been very active and, and outspoken on this topic. I was involved. We failed. We did our best, but we failed. Um, and now we have to see if we can save it. It won't be easy. But the thing I want to talk about is the digital sales tax. Uh, I saw that France has started collecting on this tax. And let me say openly, I don't think this is particularly helpful timing because it will inflame uh, sentiments in Congress. Um, I think there will be a renewed good faith effort to engage the OECD on a global effort to, to you know, discuss whether we can get to the so-called uh, Pillar 1 agreement on digital taxation internationally. Um, and I don't, I don't think actually this administration has been negotiating in good faith. But you know, the, the timing of this is, is very problematic. Uh, I also would like to see us have a truce, a truce, including on the Airbus Boeing tit for tat retaliation, giving us some time to actually clear the decks and hopefully start anew so we can focus on what really matters. And what really matters, and here I'll end, is China, 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 WTO reform. And here there's so many topics, Cecilia is the expert, uh, but let me just focus on one, quickly, one thing, and that is standard setting in the technologies of the future, which should really affect us and worry us deeply when we're talking about facial recognition, video surveillance, autonomous vehicles, we should be, if not aligning, reducing the areas of divergence. That should be doable, right? The Chinese have appointed five heads of key international standard setting bodies because they know they've identified this area is critically important to enshrine advantages for their exporters and setting their values worldwide. And uh, well, that I'll stop, but the, the agenda is broad, it's deep. I think we have a historic opportunity, really, at, in the next couple of years to try not only to clean up the wreckage of the past four years, but to build hopefully something new. And the EU, I can practically guarantee you, will be considered an essential partner of the United States in these and other areas. So thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for this clear view. And I think uh, the end of your message was very clear. And let's clean up and build something new. And also the focus on China, I think it's something that we between you and Europe also are focusing on. And you mentioned her already. What should we do with the EU-US seminar without Sophie? I would really like to introduce my very good colleague and Rino Europe Coordinator for Justice, Civil Liberty and Home Affairs Committee, or Sophie Infeld. Sophie, you have the floor. Thank you, Hilda, and, and, and thank you, uh, Ambassador Gardner. I will still say, I'm sorry, old habits, die hard. Uh, I'll be very brief. I only have a few minutes, but uh, I very warmly 
welcome your words. And I think uh, the whole of Europe is very much looking forward to, to uh, let's say, restoring the transatlantic relations. Um, but I think we all need to recognize that they will not be the same relations as before, because uh, the, the world pre-Trump was a different world. The US was a different US, but Europe was also a different Europe. And maybe the, the one thing, the single thing that President Trump has achieved, uh, in addition to everything else that he's destroyed, he managed to bring Europeans closer together. Uh, I think Europe is, is stronger, more united, uh, and more self-confident now than it was before. So uh, we are going to be a better partner for the, Europe, the United States, but also a tougher partner, I think. Uh, you've already mentioned a couple of topics uh, that I won't dwell upon, like privacy shield. Um, uh, clearly, uh, I, I think the European Union uh, has, has its own laws, its own positions, and its own interests to uh, uh, to defend, but at least now we will have a partner again, somebody to talk to uh, in, in the United States. Um, a second thing, and, and Dacian already mentioned it, uh, I was personally delighted to read about the initiative uh, of the president-elect for a global summit for democracy. Uh, and I think that we as a European parliament, we should immediately join that initiative and reach out uh, to our colleagues in, in the US Congress um, and, and make sure that this global summit is going to have a very strong transatlantic parliamentary dimension between elected representatives on both sides of the pond, because I, I think that has been lacking. And I, I hope that uh, in, in, the new, uh, in, in the new period that we are going to have more uh, closely knit working relations. And I think uh, Ambassador Lambrinidis knows exactly what I'm talking about, because a long time ago, when he and I were colleagues in the Civil Liberties Committee, we would travel together to Washington. Uh, so, you know, exactly what kind of, uh, you know, how, how we need to, uh, to, to, to deepen that, uh, that dimension. Um, and then uh, uh, one but last, there indeed, there, there are a lot of issues uh, in the area of security and law enforcement, but we, we tend to say, we make policies on the basis of shared values. And I think it is time that we redefine very explicitly and concretely what those values are, because we always assumed they were there. I think they are there, but we need to reaffirm them and, and also put them, uh, put them into words. And I think this global summit will be, uh, will be an excellent opportunity to do that. And then finally, um, I, I think in a more equal partnership, um, maybe in, in, in four years from now, not only will all Europeans be watching in excitement and, and, you know, and with lots of popcorn, the US elections, uh, but maybe the Americans will now also know, hey, they're European elections uh, and we will be watching closely what the outcome of that will be, maybe with less popcorn, but still, um, because we're equal partners. Uh, and I think the political constellation on both sides of the uh, of the Atlantic matter. And I'm personally looking very much forward uh, to working again with our American friends and allies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Sophie, for this uh, encouraging words. Um, I would now like to pass the floor to my dear colleague, Liesje Schreinermacher, who is the Reno Europe Standing Shadow Rapporteur on all matters and files related to the US in the Committee on International Trade. Sophie, you have a immense work to do, and you will be moderating the rest of our webinar. So good luck, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hilde. And uh, well, thank you, Sophie and Dacian and uh, Mr. Gardner for uh, giving their introductions. Uh, indeed, as Shadow on behalf of Renew on uh, EU-US trade relations, I'm very eager to hear what the panelists have to say about that. And uh, it is an exciting time. Um, I think um, that six years ago, as a vice president, Biden uh, said that the following about uh, transatlantic relations, and he said, the growth of the Euro-Atlantic community has turned out to be one of the greatest forces in human history for advancing peace, prosperity, security, and democracy. So now the question is obviously, uh, will a new Biden administration live up to all our expectations that we have uh, about it? I think uh, Mr. Gardner already uh, had some uh, uh, analysis about that in his introductory remarks. 
Um, and will he join forces to promote multilateralism and support rules-based trade, provide security and uh, join us in our uh, climate uh, change fight? Uh, and will we see a, a, a full reversal of all Trump policies? And as far as trade is concerned, I believe there are some uh, positive signals already. Uh, the European Parliament has uh, already taken one step forward by voting, uh, uh, by giving consent to the, the so-called lobster deal, the mini deal uh, last week. Um, so I'm really he, uh, eager to hear the panelists now about it. So uh, I would like to introduce, well, Mr. Gardner has uh, been introduced already, but we also have Dr. Cecilia Malmstrom, the former, uh, former EU Commissioner for Home Affairs and Trade. And Dr. Malmstrom was also very involved in our trade relations with the US and other strategic partners. And she currently works as an SR, uh, sorry, as an SR Gabrielson Professor at the Göteborg School of Economics. Uh, then we have also uh, the ambassador, the EU ambassador in uh, Washington, Mr. Stavros Lambrinidis, currently serving as ambassador. And uh, finally, Dr. Michael Carpenter, managing director of the Penn Biden Center for Demo uh, Diplomacy and Global Engagement. Uh, so first, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Cecilia Malmström. Uh, I'm uh, really too, uh, eager to hear what you have to say about the, the, the trade relations uh, right now. And I'm what are your expectations regarding the future Biden administration with regard to trade? I guess we can assume that the Juncker-Trump deal has died uh, on US side. So uh, what would be uh, the next step, uh, well, uh, given trade? Um, Ms. Malmström. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. It is indeed so nice to see uh, good old friends and to be back at the Renew Group as well. I just wish we could meet in person, but that's this is the second best. So, so um, uh, thank you for inviting me. I very much agree with what Tony said on, uh, on, on Mr. Biden's presidency. The transatlantic relations have indeed been very tense lately. And as a, as a true believer in the transatlantic partnership and the, the, the magic that Europe and US can do together if we, we work together, uh, that has been very sad to see. And I think we are now facing a momentum in renewed and stronger relations. We have, of course, to be realistic, as Tony said, and as everybody knows, the US, like many European countries, are very focused on the COVID crisis. US will have to do a lot uh, to heal domestic wounds uh, as well. And that will, of course, be the main priority of the president-elect. However, it is very encouraging what he has said on rejoining Paris, WHO, the Iran agreement, the non-proliferation agreement, etc., and working with allies and not against it, and of promoting by multilateralism. Uh, and this democracy summit, I fully agree with you, Sophie. This is really good news, and we're looking forward to that. So we have to be uh, optimistic, but realistic on what can be, be achieved. Uh, and we also have to, to remember that even if many people in Europe probably welcomes the victory of, 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 uh, um, of uh, Mr. Biden and, and Mrs. Harris, uh, there is a lot of trust building to, to, to be done. Trust has eroded and there is a lot of anti feelings that need to be mended as well. So, so I, I suggest that we try to focus on very concrete things to show our citizens that it is worthwhile working together. And working in the Paris Agreement, there's lots to do there on raising uh, the bar, but also on concretely defining what is environmental standards? What is green standards? How would we go about to do that? And how can we promote further sub-state uh, cooperation uh, in this and prepare for, for the next uh, conference? WTO reform, a lot to be done. We would welcome the US taking part in restoring uh, a refurbished appellate body, but also see how can we improve the daily work in the WTO? How can we uh, possibly come to a conclusion on digital trade? Uh, on fisheries to show also that WTO is still worth while and that, that it can still deliver. Hopefully it will soon have a, a new director general uh, as well who can lead the, the reform and modernization work. Uh, to, to take out of the closet or the freezer the environmental goods agreement would be a very good thing to start with and to show concrete results and to, to continue working with US on the, uh, on the medical agreement. 
trying to see if we can take away tariffs and, and other obstacles on, on medicines and uh, medical equipment would be a good way to help prepare ourselves for, for a, a next pandemic or another crisis. And this is also an area where I think lots of, of post-COVID recovery can be done by sharing good ideas across the, the Atlantic. I fully share Tony's view that TTIP is not back. Uh, it's unfortunate because we are, of course, the biggest trading partners in the world, EU and US, and not having a trade agreement is strange, but it will take time. So in the meantime, let's focus on what can be done, building on some of the, the tariff agreements, but absolutely focusing on standards with the RCP, um, agreement with China and a lot of other Asian uh, countries, China will try to push for standards, global standards. And here, US and, and Europe can really play a role by helping to define not only green standards, but all kinds of, of, of tech standards uh, to make sure that they become global and not the, 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 the Chinese uh, ones. I think we can... Uh, together work to push China to improve the level playing field, to do reforms, to continue the work that EU and US actually have done with Japan on subsidies uh, that can be, be broadened. Uh, we can continue working on investment screening together and we can push China on human rights in a more, more uh, sort of focused way than, than just uh, words. There is increased demands from, from citizens and consumers all over Europe that we do not trade and buy products that have been produced in the Xiangyang province. If you, Europe and US had a joint approach there, it would have an effect. So I think there are renewed possibilities uh, to work on human rights and on China. I would hope that US could make some good um, good uh, entrance gifts but by abolishing tariffs on aluminium and steel. Uh, President Biden-elect said that they were reckless and they are indeed and of course immediately Europe would withdraw its counter tariff and we need to sit down and find a solution on Airbus and, and Boeing as, as civilized partners. We are both sinners here so let's see if we can uh, take it from where it is and build something for the future because the future aviation industry subsidies well, there are still some things that need to be remedied in Europe and, and, and the US, but the big problem is India and China. So here we should have a joint uh, approach uh, together. So there are things, and I also want to agree with Tony on the, on the digital tax, which is actually more than a digital tax, it's a broader corporate tax. Let's try to find a solution in OECD. Uh, 137 countries are actually trying to find a solution there. It would be much better to set global standards there and to modernize the global tax system in a way uh, that, 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 that is sustainable instead of going unilaterally here and creating um, unnecessary conflicts. So working together, identifying concrete issues that matters to people to show ourselves and our citizens that working together uh, across the Atlantic and on a multilateral basis is really worthwhile would be the things uh, to prioritize. And I, I feel that Europe is ready to do it. Uh, I haven't read apart from the from a leak in, in Financial Times, the, 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 the strategy, and I know that Renew is working on a strategy. I welcome that very much. And the signals we hear from the US are, are positive on this. So I think we, there, there's reason to be an optimist. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, Stravos Lombardinis, the ambassador. And uh, well, my question to you would be, what would be your priority dossiers and files uh, from January 2021? Uh, what are the most urgent matters uh, for you uh, on which you will work on uh, with your, uh, your US uh, counterparts? Thank you. Floor is yours. Here we go. Okay, thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's, great. it's great to be back, you know. It's, uh, you, you know you've been away from the parliament for too long when no one introduces you as a former colleague other than Sophie Intveld. Thank you, Sophie. Much appreciated. And, uh, and Cecilia, you and Sophie were part of a trio team at the time uh, when you were all there and an inspiration to me as well. Uh, second point to make is that this, this here, just remember, it's called the tie. I know that no one wears it anymore after COVID, 
I have to. I am back at the office, as you can see. Uh, not everyone is, only 25% of the people back. Uh, but looking forward to uh, uh, to the moment that we can all be back, not necessarily to this, but we can all be back and hopefully uh, um, close to each other uh, next time that we meet. Now, um, the election of uh, of uh, Joe Biden uh, as president uh, is uh, is a monumental event when it comes to transatlantic relations. There's no question. Um, it, he will be a president who uh, who knows um, uh, Europe extremely well, uh, who understands and appreciates that the world that was built the past few decades. Uh, one of unparalleled uh, security and prosperity, uh, with all its problems, is a world that was built together by Americans and Europeans. Um, he is one who understands the humongous importance of the biggest economic artery of the world, especially as we're coming out of the COVID crisis and we're trying to reboost our economies. It is the EU and the US who trade and invest more in each other than with anyone else in the world. Um, and uh, in many ways, it is uh, rebooting uh, international trade that will help us, as it did back in the financial crisis, come of this, out of this uh, COVID crisis as well. Um, he uh, he uh, supports international institutions. He will return to the Paris Agreement. He will return to the WHO. And he doesn't see fundamentally, that's the biggest thing, he doesn't see the EU as an aberration. Uh, as um, as ideologically opposed to what the U.S. should be standing uh, for. Um, uh, he doesn't see uh, uh, strict uh, nationalism as the way to go for U.S. interests, and neither do we for EU interests. So there's a tremendous amount of very positive change from day one uh, that we can expect. Um, so in some ways, uh, the band will be back, okay? But the players in the band will have to play different kinds of uh, instruments or in different kinds of ways. My second point there is that, uh, you know, we will have, as always, as a EU, to, uh, to demonstrate uh, our, not just our commitment to the partnership, but our added value as well. And I think that Tony is absolutely right in mentioning that, uh, that we have to be able to show that this kind of cooperation brings concrete results, uh, much better ones than, um, uh, than the chaos of non-cooperation. Uh, but we must take into account that we're dealing with the U.S. Uh, that will be very inward looking. Uh, these elections also showed that this is a very divided country in many, many different levels. Uh, the president-elect has made it a point in his first speeches to indicate that he wants to unite the country, that he will put emphasis there, whether it is uh, dealing with economic disparities or regional disparities or racial inequalities. Uh, and uh, and therefore, we will have to play a bigger role when it comes and carry a bigger burden when it comes to promoting uh, our joint interests. Now, everyone mentioned many things. So let me just mention the one thing that is least popular of all and try to tie in the other stuff under that. And that is multilateralism. When I say least popular of all, uh, you must keep in mind that many people in the U.S., regardless of political party, um, are, are maybe at the point where they feel that they have to take a break from running the world, that they need to be a little more introspective. Uh, and, uh, and in that context, multilateralism is not always an easy word to, uh, to uh, uh, throw around. So let's become more specific. Um, this is not a kumbaya notion. Uh, the European Union doesn't deal with other partners around the world because we just like to hang around with them. It is a fundamental way to promote fundamental democratic open society, open economy values. Take COVID. We have to get those vaccines and we have to get them out and we have to get them around the world as fast and as equitably and as cheaply as we can. Because if any part of the world keeps having COVID, none of us are going to be safe from it. Our economies will not really be able to open that fast and that efficiently. And people will keep dying. And as we're having this discussion, there are countries around the world who have been going out from day one trying to use COVID also as a uh, ideological story, ideological advantage, to show that somehow the West is selfish and inefficient and incapable of handling things the way that they can. And yes, if their system actually requires you, um, you know, to get a PPE mask, to also abandon some freedom of expression, well, what the heck, that's okay. At least you won't be fighting as crazy as the Americans are fighting every day with each other or as the Europeans are fighting, right? So extremely important for the US and the EU to take the leadership together when it comes to showing the world that we are not abandoning. On the contrary, we have always been, we continue to be the biggest 
development aid donors, donors, not giving loans to people with hooks attached that will take away their liberty or corrupt them, but donors of not just free money to save health systems, uh, to support vaccinations, but also values. When it comes to uh, the economy and trade, um, the uh, WTO uh, has to be reformed. We all agree with this, but it cannot be thrown away uh, with the bathwater, as uh, has been given the impression in the past few years. So I would hope that we can immediately sit down together, as Cecilia said, and sit down and figure out the correct reforms fast. Uh, there's got to be a new uh, uh, head of the WTO, and I hope that this process can be unblocked. Uh, there has to be a change in rules, but also the appellate body has to exist. If it doesn't, we're not the only big elephants around the world anymore. And we see other countries, including China, trying to export, as I said, not just subsidized goods, but also subsidized values to others. We need a rules-based system. This is not kumbaya, as I said. This is fundamental um, uh, geostrategic interest of the U.S. and the EU, and we are poised uh, to uh, to make it happen. Um, but um, I would also say that working with others, uh, with Japan, with uh, Canada, uh, with the UK, uh, with Australia, uh, with uh, with all those, is going to be very uh, very important here. As will be getting off the table our trade irritants. Uh, like others here, I, I very much would hope uh, that when it comes to Airbus, Boeing, or when it comes to steel and aluminum, we can suspend immediately. Uh, our uh, mutual uh, 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 tariffs and get down to a true settlement uh, of the issues uh, and certainly look at what we do with steel and aluminum over capacity when it comes from uh, China, for example. But we have to stop the irritants. Uh, everyone around the world who wishes to see us divided has been opening up bottles of champagne the past few years. Uh, that is not okay anymore. It has got to stop. We have to stop it. When you look at multilateralism, think of the environment. Um, the Biden administration will take renewed leadership, and I think the appointment of, of John Kerry is a classic example of an administration, a future administration, desiring to play a leading role again. Uh, the EU has been out there in the past few years uh, at the front lines and will continue to be. Uh, there is a great advantage for being um, you know, the first mover when it comes to the environment. And we have identified it not just as a way to save the planet from a real and existential threat, but also as a new growth strategy for Europe. This is precisely what can happen in the U.S. as well. And the president-elect has indicated this many times. Can we deal with issues there? I absolutely believe so. But that is also a challenge for us, too. Look, take sustainable finance. We need to have rules and regulations uh, on this. Uh, that don't clash with each other. And only if the EU and the US sit together can we set those really effectively with multinational financial institutions. Now, we haven't done that in a few years in spite of our efforts, but the Biden administration gives us an opportunity now. We have to be able to come in, as Ursula von der Leyen has said, with a transatlantic New Deal proposal that includes discussions there. We are ahead in many areas, but we also have to be able to take a step back and see where it is that we can, for the common good of, uh, of non-competing rules, regulations, work together now, not in the future. Carbon border adjustment taxes, carbon taxation more broadly. These are issues out there that are going to be important. Uh, digital values, again, a multilateral issue. I'm sorry, COP26 and the, uh, and the uh, biodiversity summits, by the way. We need deliverables there. The U.S. needs them. We need them. That's a unique, two unique goals to put for ourselves as we work on that uh, bilateral and multilateral cooperation. Digital, uh, fully agree, fully agree. Uh, values uh, are huge here. We have seen uh, voice recognition and movement recognition being used in Xinjiang to repress people. These are standards being set as we speak today by China. They are not okay. And the only ones who can stop those standards and put other standards in place is the EU and the US together. When it comes to privacy, Keep in mind, and I tell this to my European colleagues as well, that the U.S. has moved also in the past four years and it has moved actually to a direction that recognizes much more than before that there is an issue with big platforms, with how they use data, how they store it, 
Um, so we are closer perhaps today, not just with civil society in the US, but also with Congress and certainly with the new administration, I would hope, when it comes to addressing those issues. Um, there has to be flexibility, absolutely, including on our side, but fundamentally we must understand, and my effort here in the US is to make that point again, as I have for many years, that privacy is not a luxury. It is one of the fundamental sort of pillars of, uh, of democratic fundamental rights. Um, it is something that uh, we cannot be just simply throwing away because it's an inconvenience uh, sometimes, maybe to companies or maybe to governments. Uh, we actually do live in the world where everyone wishes to and can have access to our private information. If this goes too far, and some would argue it already has, we are in a very different world uh, and not a particularly democratic one uh, than we would, uh, either of us would like to be. So this is a real issue to sit down and talk as real partners, not to fight over. Um, finally, rule of law, um, more broadly. Dear friends, when it comes to foreign policy, we have seen in the past few years what a, uh, a sometimes erratic withdrawal uh, of the U.S. From the, uh, from the international scene can bring about. In a world where you have a lot of players uh, that are regional mini powers in their own regions. And what also a U.S. signaling that perhaps might can be right, um, can do for countries like Turkey or Russia or China, even in the South China Sea. Uh, in the South China Sea, the argument that you have is that the, is that the uh, law of the sea really doesn't apply because China doesn't like it. In the Eastern Med, the argument you have from Turkey is that the law of the sea doesn't really apply because Turkey doesn't like it. Those, this retrenchment um, has been very dangerous in that it has opened up uh, a more anarchic world where people feel that we are not really truly committed to international law and values and therefore they can be injecting their own. And this can lead to conflicts that are uncontrolled and supremely dangerous for US security and EU security. So coming back to multilateralism, let me close with this, is not a nice to have policy. It's not a let's be nice to the world policy. Uh, solidarity with others is not charity. It is a, the way for us to assert democratic values and interests uh, and to address challenges from others. Tech, technology Council, let me close with that. We are already discussing with the President administration uh, setting it up. Everything that has to do with setting standards in AI, uh, to, uh, to addressing uh, standards in the environment, uh, to look in that foreign investment screening, all those things can be a subject of a bilateral conversation that builds out to a multilateral standard setting system. Let's move on with that as well. I am very hopeful for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Stavros, Ambassador. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Michael Carpenter. Um, and my question to you would be, uh, what can we expect from the Biden administration in terms of foreign policy? And I'd like to ask everyone to mute their microphone when they're not, uh, when they don't have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lizia. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, a lot of wise uh, things have already been said. Um, so let me just try to uh, encapsulate a few areas where I think there's a tremendous opportunity for U.S.-EU cooperation going forward. Uh, foreign policy is, of course, a very general uh, area, but uh, so let me dive into a few specifics. A lot has already been said about trade and economic development. Of course, I think this is a crucial area for U.S.-EU cooperation going forward. And I think the agenda is going to be so packed from the get-go that it's going to be very important for us to prioritize areas for immediate success uh, in order to be able to get some wind behind our sails that, that can then sustain cooperation on some of the trickier issues that we're going to have to deal with going forward that are unavoidable uh, and that are part of our um, US-EU agenda. What do I mean by this? I mean, starting with things, for example, in the trade uh, arena, where we work on tariffs, we get rid of perhaps as an initial step, uh, steel and aluminum tariffs, as has already been mentioned, but then progressively work towards uh, other forms of cooperation, um, including digital tax, including 
the Airbus uh, Boeing dispute, uh, including uh, carbon border adjustments uh, <clears throat> and those sorts of things. I think it's very important that we start out with momentum and then we sort of roll up our sleeves and really start to tackle some of these uh, larger, more complex issues, which we can achieve consensus on. I'm convinced that we can, uh, we can uh, cooperate on all of these tricky, uh, very uh, complex issues, uh, but that will take time. So we need to have some early wins. In climate, uh, again, you know, this, the Biden administration is gonna come back uh, to the Paris Climate uh, Accord on day one. Uh, and we're gonna have a presidential envoy uh, who is empowered to make decisions on climate and that is gonna mainstream climate into every aspect of our foreign policy. That is tremendously important. Having John Kerry there at the principles committee table uh, day in, day out, uh, making climate a priority in everything that we discuss that impinges on national security. Uh, and so, you know, again, he, in the climate arena, there's gonna be tricky things. I mentioned carbon border tax adjustments, um, the environmental goods uh, agreement, which is of course beyond just simply the US and EU and is plurilateral in nature, but there are things that we can start to tackle uh, from day one. And of course, COP26 is coming just around the corner. It's gonna be one of the first major agenda items for the administration um, that it's gonna have to start to think about on day one uh, as they start to develop their climate agenda. But the, the contrast between the Biden administration and the Trump administration on this area could not be any greater. So again, tremendous opportunities for some short-term gains, but then also for putting in place uh, long-term uh, solutions that benefit both sides. Third area that I would uh, identify is cooperation on democracy and rule of law. And, and this is uh, tremendously important. Uh, as uh, the president-elect has said, he plans to uh, hold a democracy summit within his first year in, uh, in office. Uh, we have, uh, between the US and EU, a tremendous opportunity now to, um, to strengthen democratic norms and to strengthen rule of law. This is really crucial. And, um, you know, I think we have, we obviously we have challenges that are internal uh, to our own, um, uh, to our own countries, to our own blocks. Uh, there's backsliding in the EU among a number of members, and we're going to have to apply some smart leverage to those countries. But I think what we need to do is not sort of look at this as, you know, there's some, some problem countries that we have to deal with, but really think of this as an opportunity to sort of look internally at what can we do to strengthen democracy at home. And especially on the anti-corruption front uh, in terms of combating, for example, money laundering, uh, there is uh, a number of things that we can start to do immediately within the first six months of a Biden administration, working with the EU to set up a EU-wide anti-money laundering regulator and then having that transatlantic cooperation uh, to tackle money laundering. This is, this is both a conduit through which foreign adversaries like Russia, China, and Iran uh, subvert our democracies, but it's also an internal source of uh, corruption uh, and democratic backsliding. So this, other areas of, of rule of law are, are, are very, very important. Fourth area I would identify is, um, is sort of aligning our strategic visions uh, on uh, great power competition, how to deal with uh, Russia, how to deal with China, how to deal with Iran. And you know, I would just note that particularly when it comes to China, uh, the US-EU relationship is gonna be crucially important. Obviously, NATO will probably play the uh, predominant role in building up defense and deterrence capabilities against Russian uh, aggression in the future. But when it comes to China, we have to look at a very different uh, set of tools. Of course, there is deterrence uh, and defense, and that is an important part of our China strategy going forward. A lot of that will be focused on the Indo-Pacific region. In the transatlantic region, we need to focus on things like coordinating investment screening mechanisms, on coordinating export controls, on looking at how to potentially set up a consortium uh, where we pool 5G technologies to be able to, uh, to uh, block Chinese malign influence uh, in that area. And, and so these are a set of, um, of issues that are not sort of in the 
necessarily in the NATO toolbox, but much more in the US EU toolbox, um, and where we have a, a lot that we can do together. For example, preventing strategic acquisitions of critical infrastructure uh, by empowering other sorts of initiatives, like the Three Cs initiative that can hopefully spur investments in critical infrastructure that are non-Chinese, that are not uh, linked to BRI, but that are uh, fueled by our own private sector and our, uh, and our own governments. Um, and then lastly, there's a huge agenda of uh, cooperation in terms of diplomacy within the transatlantic space. And uh, Turkey has been mentioned. I would add also the Western Balkans. I would add the South Caucasus, the tremendous democracy movement that we are seeing in Belarus right now. This is the sort of issue that the US and the EU should precisely be coordinating on both in terms of sort of punitive measures like sanctions against the agents of repression in Belarus, but then also trying to really come up with a proactive positive agenda that empowers Belarusian civil society, that empowers Belarusian independent media, that per perhaps puts on the table a plan uh, for the economic reconstruction of Belarus in the event of a, of a democratic transition. Those are the sorts of things where diplomatically we, we need to be working together. We need to be speaking with the same voice. Certainly on Turkey, this is gonna be a crucial challenge going forward, not only because of Turkey's recent aggressive, uh, 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 aggressive behavior in the Aegean and the Eastern Med, but also in the South Caucasus with, with Turkey's empowerment of the Azerbaijani offensive into Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Turkey's actions in, of course, in Idlib province, in Syria, and in, in Libya. There's a whole host of things there. You know, uh, uh, the last administration was sort of preoccupied with this, in my view, um, uh, this chimera of trying to split apart Russia and China, working with Russia to try to uh, develop that cleavage. You know, I frankly, I, I don't see much scope in that effort, but I do see some scope in the effort of trying to split Turkey from from Russia. But what I think it's going to take is it's going to take a very well thought out strategic plan where the US and the, and the EU are working together and presenting Turkey with an incentive structure that is different from the one that it currently faces. So that President Erdogan and his team see a clear incentive for working with us on areas uh, where uh, we see potential common interests down the road. So in all of these areas, I see opportunity, but we have to immediately roll up our sleeves. And, and as I said at the beginning, I really do believe that we need to prioritize some of the quick wins that we can achieve. So we have some of that momentum at our backs and then simultaneously start to tackle some of these longer term challenges that will be complex and require perhaps years before they reach fruition. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carpenter, for your uh, intervention. Uh, I see some eager MEPs uh, uh, in the Zoom call as well who uh, might want the floor uh, to ask some questions. Uh, can I give the floor to uh, to a new member? Or yeah, I see Bart Groothuis. Well, thank you very much, Lisha, and thank you very much to all speakers. I uh, very much welcome the remarks that have been made by Cecilia Malmström on technology standards, for example. Um, I think we should push that more. Um, the Chinese are with their strategy of pushing it. Uh, they are trying to impose their standards on the world and I'm very, very worried about it. And I think it's not just a, 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 a body of a governing body issue. It's also a tech industry issue. And that's traditionally where we hold back and we think that's an industry issue, but it's not. I think we should do that on both sides of the Atlantic. But my real question is this to Dr. Carpenter, and it's about Marietje Schaken. So the ambassador uh, just mentioned he's a former MEP, but Marietje Schaken is one too from our party. And she's, she's on Stanford University. And she recently wrote a wonderful piece on governing the tech spheres um, between the US and the EU. I think there, she, she's right, there should be a governing body between both sides of the Atlantic, looking at data, looking at the tech sphere. And I'd like to uh, hear your opinion on this one. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for that question. And I um, I have gotten to know Marietje over the years and, and agree she is an absolutely brilliant thinker in this uh, space and, and not just in this space, but beyond it as well. 
Uh, I very much agree. I forget who it was among the previous speakers who spoke uh, to the need to establish a tech council uh, that would immediately begin to look into these sorts of issues. Uh, you know, there is so much in the tech space where we need to be discussing both data flows, privacy, regulation. There is also a clear link that we've seen um, now analyzed and, and, and described between this sort of algorithmic business model, if you like, that feeds on toxic content and the growth of demagogic populism, particularly on the far right. And I think if we really long-term want to address um, some of the roots of the ills in our societies, including my own uh, here in the United States, I think we really need to take a good hard look at how the tech platforms business models sort of feed this demagogy and toxicity in our in our discourse. I don't think this is some sort of airy fairy, you know, sociological type of issue. I think it has very concrete sort of practical political ramifications that we deal with every day and that we need to start to address very quickly because um, this is getting out of control in so many countries. And so whether it's we're talking about data privacy or whether we're talking about um, this sort of disc hate discourse uh, that's emerging uh, on uh, the tech platforms, um, we need to have a coordinated conversation because obviously what we do in the United States affects Europe, what you do in the EU affects us. Um, and we really have the same, the same sort of values and, and the same ultimate strategic goals here. Um, protect democracy, protect privacy, protect data flows. Um, we may sometimes look at it from slightly different perspectives, but ultimately we can achieve uh, what we want to achieve only if we work together and then expand those standards that we achieve in the US EU framework to potentially other democratic nations. And I think that's the name of the game in a lot of our uh, co cooperation is establishing a framework for cooperation amongst perhaps a small group of nations or perhaps in the US EU framework and then expanding it globally. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Bernard Guetta, also a Renew member uh, who would like uh, to ask a question. Thank you. Euh, ce, merci d'abord. Deuxièmement, c'est moins une question que trois remarques. Est-ce que je peux me le permettre? First of all, thank you for giving me the floor. Can I, uh, can I say three things? Because it's more remarks than questions. First remark, the paper that was published this morning in the Financial Times is fair and encouraging. As we all know, it is fair and encouraging that the EU took the initiative to make those proposals. Indeed, American and Euro European Democrats must defend together a democracy that is at stake throughout the world, and not only by Beijing. Then, second remark. We had three cultural revolutions. The first one is that we cannot afford, as European and American Democrats, to argue, to have trade conflicts. So this is the first cultural revolution we need. We must work in a spirit of brotherhood and of com community. We must be a community of fighters for democracy. The second cultural revolution we need involves us as Europeans. It is not because Trump has been defeated and that Joe Biden got elected, even if we are very happy with his election. We cannot think that because of that, we will come back to the time of Cold War and absolute and total American protection. No, it won't be the case. We must build a European common defense so that our 
American allies consider us properly. Then the third cultural revolution will be an American revolution. The US cannot hope to divide, to rule in Europe. Europe will become a strong political actor and the transatlantic alliance will now be an alliance with two equal actors. With those three revolutions, we will be able to defend together democracy, which is a very urgent task. Thank you very much. Thank you so, uh, so much, Bernard. Um, I would also like to uh, make the audience aware that they could also uh, ask uh, questions. Uh, we have uh, people following us on Zoom, Facebook and Livecast. And uh, we'd like to invite the audience to also ask questions uh, on these three platforms. Uh, we've already received some questions, so uh, I would li now like to uh, read one. And uh, this is uh, one uh, question um, to uh, doc Dr. Carpenter. It's by Alice Stolmeyer from Defend Democracy. And uh, it reads, uh, while much in favor of Biden's proposed summit for democracy, how to ensure it will create durable deliverables? Should it become an international institution with annual gatherings of stakeholders, including NGOs, that reforms or replaces the community of democracies, uh, perhaps a climate COP-like process with working groups, accords, and annual progress. Uh, do you have any uh, views on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think this is something that we're going to have to remain flexible on. Uh, we did establish, of course, a community of democracies as well as an open government partnership that were intended to be permanent structures that would foster uh, democratic norms in the first case and transparency and anti-corruption in the second case. Um, and you know, each, each is, um, has had some, some good wins and, and uh, made progress, but also has not perhaps fulfilled the full potential that they had. Um, I'm hoping that the summit of democracy will spur action that does not necessarily result in an institutionalized structure. Um, that, that may be something that occurs if it's decided that that is the best way to capture the gains um, of what is pledged in that initial gathering, but I'm not convinced that it's necessary to regularize it um, and bureaucratize it. I think there is something to be said about having an extraordinary gathering that brings together countries that pledge, but here's the key, but that pledge to make, to do concrete actions, both to get invited to the table in the first place, but then also to be able to reap the benefits of uh, the final communique that is issued. Um, and, you know, I, I'm willing to be flexible on this. I don't have a, a sort of a, a hard set uh, uh, set of views uh, on this particular issue, but I think maintaining flexibility and having this be something more extraordinary that, that drives cooperation among like-minded is more important than, than bureaucratizing a structure over the long term. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So we have a next question, and um, I guess this is for uh, Ambassador uh, Lambrinidis. Um, it's by uh, Charles Sydney to my uh, yeah by Charles Sydney. And given the disengagement from NATO and the clear contempt of Europe during the Republican presidency under Trump, do you think that Macron's goal of increasing uh, European strategic autonomy? will help strengthen or weaken transatlantic relations in the long term. And whatever Biden's multilateral learnings uh, uh, are, can Europe rely on the USA in the long term? Okay. Well, as a EU ambassador, I'm the least uh, well positioned to comment on any particular EU leaders' um, um, uh, statements. But what I will say uh, is that um, in the past few years, the EU has uh, uh, picked up the um, uh, 
the burden of uh, defense in a much more strategic, uh, efficient and effective way than in the past through cooperating on the EU programs of PESCO and EDF. Um, now, these are complex programs. But fundamentally, what we agreed to do is to um, research and innovate more together, to invest more together, to produce more together, and to deploy more together. And to do so um, uh, both in our neighborhood uh, and elsewhere when that is necessary. Um, we already have uh, a number of uh, uh, security um, uh, and defense missions uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, and uh, expanding on those is one of the goals we've set for ourselves. We've also agreed that we have to stop wasting the money that we use on defense as we have today and start investing it much more effectively uh, for the benefit of NATO as well. Uh, the classic example of 17 or 18 battle tanks that are used in EU member states as opposed to one that is used in the US or two, um, just because we're not coordinating better together to produce one uh, that would be, uh, you know, supremely advanced uh, is an example that we ought to take into account. Keep in mind, we are spending with the second biggest spender, EU member states after the US when it comes to defense. Uh, together, we belong indeed in NATO, which is a security umbrella and will remain a security umbrella. Um, but for us to be most effective in NATO, we have to become better individually. We don't have a Greek army and a Greek NATO army and a French army and a French NATO army. Uh, it is uh, it is one thing. So uh, I have very much hope that we can move there. There have been some discussions the past few years as to whether or not this effort uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, the EU working more closely together is a bad thing or a good thing uh, for the US. There were many misunderstandings, uh, a sense that the EU was trying to move away from uh, NATO. Uh, that's, of course, uh, entirely not true. It's in our treaties even. Um, uh, but uh, but yes, uh, the EU has to become better at uh, investing and producing things and deploying uh, people. Uh, and uh, this, if we achieve, is going to be extremely good for U.S. security as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, now we have a question of Goldshay Budo. And uh, he is asking about uh, digital taxes talking about taxing the digital economy in case the US does not want to collaborate on the level of the OECD. How likely would it be for the EU to adopt the digital services tax and the significant digital presence tax, knowing that was already blocked a few years ago because no agreement was, was reached amongst member states? Uh, it's not uh, directed at any particular panelist, but... Uh, well, if, 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 I, if I may jump in very quickly Yes, of course. Just, just, to say, just to say that Ursula von der Leyen, in a recent speech of hers, uh, uh, indicated that we are totally committed to the OECD process. Uh, the, the Trump administration froze its participation in it on Pillar 1 in the past few months. Uh, we very much hope that, uh, that the Biden administration would re-engage uh, to have a very serious discussion to reach a, a conclusion, if possible. And the reason is that, of course, uh, it is not sustainable, uh, either politically or democratically, frankly, for some companies to be making uh, huge amounts of profits. And we see digital companies all over the world, not just in the U.S., especially during COVID, uh, increasing dramatically their profits, uh, to be basing their sales and those profits on what is in Europe uh, uh, probably the highest education system, uh, a, a very high uh, uh, you know, uh, living standards, uh, all these things that we are investing in as Europeans, including the single market, and then not to be paying a fair amount of taxes for that. Uh, now, what, 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 what is fair and what is not fair is part, part of the discussion to be had. But I fully agree with Mike uh, that this is not going to be a necessarily a very easy discussion to have, but it is a discussion that, if you agree on the basic principle, uh, can become much easier. Uh, then you can, at the OECD level, find a solution, and, uh, and Ursula von der Leyen has indicated that that ideally it's going to be the mid of next year where that um, solution should be uh, on the uh, on the table if you can if you can bring it there. Uh, so um, I am uh, I am hopeful on this uh, on this uh, front, and this is precisely an area in which I think EU US cooperation could make a big difference. Uh, but I do see it also as Mike does as a potential uh, irritant. Uh, that needs to be addressed uh, in a smart way now. And as, uh, and as uh, Tony mentioned before, I don't know if Tony has left already. Um, uh, but yes, I would, um, 
I would most certainly focus uh, my emphasis on this in the first, uh, but it's, I, I don't think it's a, one of the quick wins that Mike mentioned, but it's one of the quick, uh, uh, avoid a quick bad story, if you like, if we manage to engage constructively. Cecilia, would you like to comment on that uh, as well? I saw you uh, yes, raise your very hand. Very briefly, I think that it would be very unfortunate if the EU ran to do something unilaterally right now. First of all, the 27 are not united, as we saw a couple of years ago, and they will certainly not be now either. So it will be a couple of countries uh, doing this, and this will most certainly um, create conflicts with, with the US. But, but even more serious is, is that we could then kill a process that has been going on for a few years. It's, it's difficult, it's tricky, it's extremely technical, but it is actually advancing. And we have what, almost 140 countries who are willing to work together to sort of modernize the modern tax system and to see where how do we deal with companies who generate value in one country and are based in another? And how, how do you avoid double taxation? How do you solve conflicts? And it has gone rather far, the, 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 the cooperation here. The aim was to conclude before Christmas. That's not possible because of COVID and the American uh, elections. But the, the aim in this working group, led by, by very clever economists, is that possibly by the summer it, it could lead to something. So I really hope that the EU would hold its horses a bit and give that international multilateral process uh, a chance because it would truly be historic if it, it, it achieved. And, and um, that, that you have to, to take that narrative as well. I know that this is very important in some individual countries, in France, for instance, and, and I understand the pressure on French politicians, but to, to build the narrative that, that if we can achieve it globally, it's actually much more efficient and, and sustainable. Thank you. And uh, we now we have a further question, which is uh, quite an existential one, uh, if I may add. Uh, it was uh, posed by uh, Anders Larsen. And uh, the question is, we are discussing rebuilding, resuscitating and saving uh, a lot. Can and should we try to force a realignment when the EU, UK and USA and the multilateral order, which they upheld, are in radically different uh, relationship based upon the radically different states they find themselves in. And the question is, let's consider the possibility that the world order, as we knew it, is unable to be saved or resuscitated. If, if it is, then it is, uh, and that is a big if, what would be the panelist preferential new multilateral order look like? So, <laughs> who's eager to take that question? <laughs> Stavos, you are on mute. Yes, I, I said I nominate Mike Carpenter. Well, to take on the question. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I can start. I, I think I see uh, Leah Malmstrom also raising her hand. Um, you know, I don't think we should think about discarding elements of the old order that are currently still in place. Take, for example, the WTO. I mean, we're not going to we're not going to reinvent something from scratch. We're not going to go back to block zero. Uh, we have a WTO that that has problems with it. We have to reform it, um, and we should get to the business of doing that. Uh, take another completely different area, such as freedom of navigation. You know, freedom of navigation norms are being challenged uh, all over the world in the Arctic, in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the Straits of Hormuz and elsewhere. Uh, we need to try to uphold that norm. It's not gonna be easy. It's gonna take a lot of investments and a lot of coordinated action, but we shouldn't just simply give up on it and say, uh, well, we're gonna go back to some sort of 19th or 18th century spheres of influence model uh, where you know, nations don't get to, uh, don't get to uh, navigate through certain parts of, of the world's oceans. Um, take digital. Uh, again, um, you know, we can't sort of decide that we're going to deal with uh, with nothing in this space. We have to create uh, a set of norms and standards that that we apply to ourselves. And when we do that, you know, the Chinese and others uh, will have to uh, factor in what we have agreed amongst each other. So I don't think there's any going back to sort of the um, going back to, to square one. Uh, I think we have to build on what we have, of course, improve. Um, of course, amend when it's necessary to amend, but, um, but build on 
uh, actually quite a bit of infrastructure that we have created over these last you know, 75 years since the end of the Second World War. Cecilia, yeah. No, I very much agree with that. I mean, the multilateral system or the multilateral model is not static. It changes all the time because the world is changing. It's based on the idea that we cooperate together, that there are certain norms and sets and that you try to find compromises and that you cooperate uh, with, with a few fundamental values at, at your basis. And as we have some huge challenges together, the, the, the person who asked the question talked about the US, EU and, and UK. I mean, we have, first of all, we have to get out of the COVID crisis and preferably stronger on the other side. We have to prepare for future crisis. We have the climate crisis, the biggest threat to humanity. We have threats that we, we have, we have um, um, lack of, of level playing field in, in, in China, in trade, and the list is long. Mike Carpenter mentioned a few others. So, so you, you, you modernize and you update the models as you go by, but the notion that the alternative is to everybody on their own, we've tried that as well. It doesn't work. That was the first days of the COVID crisis. It was a very bad uh, thing. And finally, the EU got its act together uh, and tried to, to cooperate and, and look where we are now. Uh, so, so I don't see any alternatives, but of course it's not a model that you just copy paste and, and, and take from, from the, the, the 60s, you, you evolve as it is, but there's no way we can get out of all these uh, alone. And that, that's the beauty of it, that we are actually stronger together. It might sound a bit Pollyannish, but, but we are actually stronger together. Uh, and that, that's what, what I hope that this renewed transatlantic partnership also can, can show to, to our, our citizens. And if I, if I may just say very quickly to add, I think that both the, uh, the uh, Biden administration and we in Europe understand that to build this, uh, uh, this uh, multilateral world um, uh, that we're envisioning, uh, based on what we've achieved up to now, but also recognizing that it needs to change, uh, we need to be stronger and more united internally as well. Uh, so uh, those two things uh, in some ways go hand in hand, uh, which is why um, the president-elect is uh, spending so much time emphasizing the need to build back better in the U.S. to address, uh, you know, a number of issues here, which is why we in Europe um, managed uh, during the COVID crisis uh, to overcome some of the biggest uh, challenges of the financial crisis and, and come out and borrow together as European uh, Union with the backing of all our member states and, uh, and uh, distributing them in, in, in a solidaire way that, that fund to our member states to make the single market stronger. It is those kinds of decisions that crisis sometimes force you to make because they bring you face to face with the deficiencies of your own system uh, that will ensure in the end of the day that we can build the new multilateralism better together. Thank you. And uh, the next question that we have is on the conference uh, on the future of Europe. It's uh, posed by Corina Rebege, uh, Center for European Policy Analysis. And her question is uh, to Cecilia and Stavros. Um, do you see uh, any role for the US during the conference on the future of Europe? The, uh, the US has been engaged in the European construction from the very beginning and might be good to maintain that in involvement. Do you see a role for the US uh, in the conference? Well, I think we have to wait for this conference to roll out. It's been postponed now for quite some time. Uh, but, but even if there's always reason to talk and to have influence, and, and I'm sure there will be plenty of, of American think tanks who will be producing papers and, and inputs, this conference is basically for the citizens of Europe to discuss priorities for their future. So the American relationships and the different areas of cooperation or conflicts that we have will certainly play in, but, but this is for, for, for the citizens of Europe mainly to, to come up with proposals and suggestions on how to, to improve and how to, to uh, focus the, the, the work of, of, of the European Union in the future. Yeah, Stavros, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think I, I agree. I agree with uh, fundamentally with Cecilia, but there's no question that some of the issues we were discussing, strengthening our own democracy internally, um, uh, you know, strengthening our, um, uh, our values, strengthening our economies and our competitiveness, whether it's in the environment or in digital, 
I'm sure that many of these uh, and many of our thinking uh, will be very relevant also to, uh, to the US when similar discussions take place. So whereas I wouldn't try to merge those two discussions together, as Cecilia mm -hmm. said, ours will have to be our own. Uh, I most uh, certainly will, uh, will uh, try from my perspective to hook in um, you know, people from the US to be following, listening uh, that, uh, that discussion. Thank you. And then uh, Mr. Um, uh, Mrs. Rebegea uh, had a second question uh, to Dr. Carpenter, and uh, it says, um, how can the US and the EU work better together on deterring Russia and Russian uh, malign actions? What concrete steps can we expect to see once the new US administration takes office in January? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think in terms of sort of conventional and nuclear defense and deterrence, there are a number of steps that uh, should be taken to continue to strengthen the deterrence along the eastern flank. I think in particular, the Black Sea region is an area in need of greater uh, capability investment, more posture as well. Uh, there are other things, uh, adaptations that we need to continue to make in other theaters like the Baltic theater, where for example, the Baltic air policing mission uh, needs to be transitioned over time into a Baltic air defense mission. There's also a need, uh, I think, for long range fires uh, in place in either the Baltics or in Poland. Uh, but those are adaptations to the, the sort of incremental uh, force posture decisions that have been made over the last few years, where I think there is a, a need for much greater focus and attention is not on the conventional and nuclear side, but on the, shall we say, hybrid or, or gray zone side. Uh, I think as Russia finds itself without a pathway towards uh, either conventional or nuclear dominance because of mutually assured destruction and deterrence on the nuclear side and because of uh, a fairly exquisite set of NATO capabilities on the conventional side, naturally, Russia sort of pushes into those areas where it sees an asymmetric advantage, dark money, disinformation, cyber, energy coercion, and so on and so forth. And this is where, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of analysis has been done recently over the last few years. There's a phenomenal NATO-EU uh, center of excellence in Helsinki on, on hybrid threats, uh, but that is an analytic center. When it comes to actual policies to defend and deter, we lag far behind. And, and that's where I think there is a, a, a common agenda that is both a NATO agenda and simultaneously an EU agenda where we need to put a lot more stake and a lot more resources. This includes things like anti-money laundering, which I, uh, which I discussed before. It includes uh, transparency and campaign finance. Uh, to prevent some of the sort of the Kremlin uh, dark money operations that we've seen in a number of European countries, uh, potentially also in my own country, um, uh, in order to be able to both deter, counteract, um, and, and make simply reduce the vulnerabilities that currently exist uh, in the disinformation space. Again, we need to look at the tech platforms. I already spoke about this and, and, and go from just simply exposing uh, the sources and methods of Russian or Chinese disinformation and actually try to change some of the structural conditions within big, big tech that allow disinformation to have such a malign influence on our societies. So this is a whole agenda that uh, that is before us and that frankly, I don't think is all that controversial. I don't think it's something that the Russians will see as threatening, that the Chinese will necessarily see as threatening, but that will have a huge impact in our ability to withstand some of this subversive activity and malign influence. Um, so let's roll up our sleeves and start to work on this. But I think the key is, you know, not to just sort of pigeonhole this into either NATO or the EU, but to be flexible about the types of architectures that we bring to bear to deal with these sorts of challenges. Like 5G, you know, 5G is the sort of thing that perhaps is best tackled as uh, uh, Prime Minister Johnson has suggested in a D10 format. You know, I, I'm not uh, necessarily uh, completely sold on that as being the right format for this, but I think it makes sense. Other things we can tackle in the G7, but the NATO EU sort of framework is a very good one for, for looking at this set of challenges. Thank you. Mike, um, let me just say, let, yeah, let me just say when, it, when it comes to this information, I, I fully agree with you, of course, and. Uh, 
And uh, as you probably know, the EU has been um, tackling this for a while now, trying to find uh, approaches together with uh, with the business, uh, civil society uh, platforms, uh, through voluntary codes of conduct, now through the new um, uh, regulations and laws that, is co that it is um, uh, coming up with. Um, what has always concerned me about this information myself is that I feel that there's something deeper in our societies we have to deal with that goes beyond what the Russians or the Chinese may be doing or wanting to do. Um, you know, at the beginning, we're talking about uh, digital literacy and how important that is to promote. And indeed it is to be able to show people how to best uh, sift through all the information. Uh, but if you have people who simply know that what they're reading is probably false, but they don't care uh, because it, it fits in a particular point of view that they, that they want to hold and they're happy to spread it around, that goes beyond what some outside influencer might want to do. So I would be supremely interested in finding a way to discuss that issue in our societies. Why it is that we may have reached the point that we have that kind of echo chambering and there is no question that what the algorithms and the platforms are doing is, um, is part of the problem, uh, but uh, there may be more issues there. So that's the kind of discussion I think that the communities or democracies could have or discussion as some of the democracies in addition to, of course, uh, corruption and all those things that you very correctly mentioned. Thank you. And uh, I believe that uh, Bart Groothuis, uh, our new MEP, has another question. Uh, Bart? Yeah, a very short one, because I was very thrilled that uh, Mr. Carpenter has actually touched on the subject of hybrid, hybrid threats. I've, as a member of the uh, Disinformation and uh, Foreign Influence uh, Committee in uh, the European Parliament, I recently wrote a non-paper about the grey area that exists in international law between retortion and full retaliation, and there's actually nations making good use of that, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, and I was very much touched by what you said, and I agree with you, but now the international scholars in academic literature have actually said, well, we need a form of new, a new treaty in order to have a form of collective self-defense against hybrid threats. Um, I've been discussing this with them for a couple of months right now. Um, I was wondering, how do you view this? Do we need a new treaty? You were eagerly stating we could do this without, we were very flexible with current EU and NATO assignments. Whereas many international lawyers tell me, well, if you would want something in place, collective self-defense with democratic countries around the world, which I would also agree on, then you would need a new treaty. How do you see this? Well, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical that a treaty can accomplish um, a reduction in hybrid uh, threats or, or subversive measures uh, because of the problem of attribution and verification. And so even the most exquisitely crafted arrangement or treaty uh, would uh, be open to violation uh, from day one. And if that were the case, then you know it would immediately lose currency, um, and uh, and would not be worth the effort. Uh, it's been suggested, in fact, the the Kremlin has suggested on numerous occasions that uh, the U.S. enter bilaterally into either a cyber uh, agreement uh, or into a non-interference agreement uh, with the Kremlin. Uh, I am not opposed to discussing, for example, cyber norms uh, with the Russians. Um, you know, I think probably uh, bilaterally is the place where I would start with that, but I wouldn't hold out a whole lot of hope. Uh, in the Obama administration in which I served, we did have uh, extensive uh, conversations on cyber norms uh, with our Russian uh, friends, but, uh, and, you know, and we made some good progress in terms of uh, uh, bringing issues to light that needed to be discussed. I don't think we necessarily got to the place where we saw merit in a formal agreement. Uh, and so uh, color me skeptical, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't discuss. I think, in fact, as we do discuss strategic stability uh, with the Russians, which is something that I very much hope the uh, Biden administration will do, I think we also have to talk about some of the unintended consequences of uh, non-conventional threats and how they could pose uh, uh, an escalation threat. Uh, on both sides. And so we do need to discuss 
but uh, but yeah, color me skeptical on the treaty. Thank you so much. Um, I now have, well, for every uh, panelist, one final question. And to uh, Cecilia, that would be, uh, you spoke about uh, the fact that we, uh, you, you do not see a comprehensive trade agreement anytime soon between the US and the EU, uh, even though we are uh, each other's uh, biggest trading partners uh, and it's a little weird that we don't, uh, we will probably uh, won't have one um, in the near future. And um, well, you've been uh, involved in TTIP, uh, obviously, and I was wondering what are the le lessons that can be learned from the TTIP process? Uh, um, how, what can we do differently in the future uh, in that sense? Thank you. Well, indeed, I think it is a pity that uh, on a short term basis, I don't see um, the likelihood of a comprehensive trade agreement with us between us. And that's why we should start with a few concrete small issues, but, but together they will be, be, be um, helpful and they can build the trust because TTIP in Europe, uh, whereas most countries actually supported it, there was a very uh, emotional um, debate around this in some countries, huge demonstrations and, and a, a strong anti-feeling on, on this. Uh, so so we, we will have to, to learn from, from that process uh, if we restart negotiations on a longer term basis to be sure that we explain very, very concretely what we want to do. Also, there were difficulties in the US on this. There were not demonstrations on the, on the street, but there were uh, hesitations on this. And those were there even under Obama presidency. I mean, we achieved a lot, but there were treasure because both the EU and US are, are big superpowers and we are used to do trade deals with others. And in the end, we get we get through what we want. Uh, but here, both of, of these countries who are big standard setters as well, you know, it was hard to, 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 to convince. I think it is possible because the world has changed and also many other trade agreements in the world are, are there uh, who would reinforce the case for, 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 for the EU and US to work closely uh, together. Uh, but I would start with building trust on, on a few concrete issues. And then of course the EU needs to do some, some more opening in agriculture. That is a, a sticking point. And the US, and that unfortunately was repeated by president-elect, um, will have to open up on issues such as buy America, buy American. And there he said that this is something that he would want to strengthen. And this is of course a no-go for, for the EU. So on both these issues, they will have to make uh, we will have to make um, concessions from both sides. And I don't think we are ready to do that. But in the meantime, again, sorry to be repetitive, let's start with what is possible and to show at least that some, some small steps are, are uh, profitable, they are beneficial for jobs and for investment on, on both sides. And then one day, maybe we'll see. Thank you, Cecilia. And uh, I see Stavros, would you like to take the floor? No? No, 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 not really. I mean, I think okay. that what uh, what Mike and Tony mentioned as uh, as quick wins at the beginning of their interventions, uh, I fully subscribe to when it comes to trade. Uh, and then I would I would put the launching of a trade and technology council um, to discuss all these issues we we talked about um, uh, as a uh, as a goal, perhaps in the first hundred days, as opposed to the first ten days or, or something like that. Um, I would uh, I would put discussions on digital taxation and, and all these things in there, and I would put um, um, uh, you know uh, WTO reform discussions there as well. I think we have a tremendous amount of good stuff there uh, that can be positive. Yeah, thank you. And um, now to Dr. Carpenter, what would we, what would you think uh, would be the way to uh, build trust in the, the near near future between the EU and the US? In the trade space. Well, in the trade space, I would, you know, I already said, I think we would start with removing the tariffs on aluminum and steel. Yeah. I very much like the idea of a, a near term, well, a medium term goal, shall we say, of a zero tariff agreement. Um, I, I think you can sequence that with uh, starting with tariffs on industrial goods and then moving to the trickier issues like ag and uh, services. Uh, but, uh, but I like the idea of, of tackling this uh, conceptually um, and, and trying to sort of set a number of goalposts and, 
and you know with each goal post you you get more momentum and and then uh, you can bring in some regulatory and harmonization issues as well uh, down the road but i think from the from the get go you start with you know removing the sort of the the, the trade war if you will that that currently exists that this current administration has imposed um, and then uh, moving towards uh, removing tariffs on as many uh, goods as you can in a sort of a sequential manner. That, that's how I would approach it. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, going forward and approaching it one by one, step by step would be uh, more viable than, uh, than, uh, than talking about agriculture too much because it's when you, even when you look at the Renew Your Group, uh, that's something that, uh, um, uh, that some of us have uh, uh, differing opinions on, uh, let's say. Um, all right, so we uh, we have uh, reached the end of the um, of our webinar, and I would really uh, like to uh, thank the speakers, um, uh, Dr. Malmström and Mr. Lembrini. Uh, let me say it well, Lembrinidis and Dr. Carpenter, and obviously Mr. Gardner, who had to leave early. Thank you for your very interesting and insightful contributions. And uh, based obviously on your valuable experience in the transatlantic relations, we've heard uh, many uh, goals uh, that we could uh, focus on on the short term, but also on the longer term and uh, see where the EU and the US uh, can find each other and strengthen each other and strengthen our transatlantic relationship. Uh, I would also like to thank everyone uh, who was watching and who uh, posed questions. Um, and uh, we'll hope you'll join us for a new webinar uh, very soon. So, uh, and then uh, I'll wish you a good evening uh, today. Thank you so much.